You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at the KGVM offices speaking via Zoom with Dr. Doug McDonald, archaeologist and author of the book, Before Yellowstone, Native American Archaeology in the National Park. We are super excited to talk with Doug, who both of us know um, and have known for a while. But first, Crystal, let's check in. It's yeah. been a while since we've done a podcast. It has been. Yeah. We, how, how have you been over the holidays in the break? Good, good. I think I think we've had a two or three week break here, and it's just been a really nice holiday. We had a quiet holiday at home, me and Larry and the kids, and we really just kind of hunkered down and enjoyed. A good COVID holiday? A, yeah, a good COVID, another nice. second. COVID mm, okay. <laughs> Except we did have my mom and dad over for dinner this year, Yay. which last year we did not. So, um, right. so, it felt so there like, we go. A yeah, little, little, little expanded. Progress. <laughs> <laughs> but Nancy, I want to ask you how your break was, because you, you are always going somewhere exciting and, and awesome. And I you did that again. I had another trip. So mm. yes, to visit my husband's family in South Africa, um, we flew over right into the heart of Omicron land. And um, we all, you know, well, my husband and I got our boosters right before we left. And I think uh, we were very glad we did. Okay. People around us were going down like flies. Yeah. So, um, so that meant that we could sort of quarantine a little bit when we first got there just to make sure we hadn't picked up anything on the way. And so we got to spend time with Ian's parents who own this beautiful, um, game farm where people can also come and stay in these separate self-catering lodges. And so there's giraffe and zebra and oh, kudu wow. and pretty amazing warthog babies everywhere. Oh. It's the season. They're all having babies. So uh, that was amazing. And then um, my daughter Kaylee was able to come over. So we had a really lovely time. My husband's parents are in their 80s and we hadn't seen them for three years. Oh, yeah. So that was really wonderful to be able to do that. And um, turns out everyone was able to stay pretty healthy, uh, except my kids back in Bozeman. They <laughs> they caught COVID in Bozeman. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. other than that, um, I had a lot of fascinating discussions about the book I'm obsessed with called... Um, the Dawn of Everything, oh, which yes, I hope yeah. we will have a podcast yeah, session about so. one of these days so. by by one of my favorite anthropologists who passed away, David Graeber. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I left that book with my father-in-law, so mm -hmm. he's currently reading it. Um, so I, we'll, I got we'll it see for the Christmas. So I, right, gonna, yeah. It's, it's on my to-read list. I've so. been putting it on everyone's <laughs> list. So, uh, yeah. And um, and I, I got the bad news that because of the frigid temperatures you guys had here yeah. while I was in the balmy southern hemisphere... Oh. We had a pipe burst at the shop at yeah. Mocha, so yeah. that was exciting for um, my entire staff. They got sandbags in the store and, and saved the whole thing from flooding. So, As you um, were basking in the sun in I South Africa. I was like, you go. They were amazing. They were that's amazing. Good. My staff was great. So, yeah, so we're good. Oh, we're good. good. Wow. So, so that's been good, but we should probably um, turn back to our guests. We should. We should. So we're so glad to have you with us here today, Doug. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So, Doug, before we start, um, we usually read um, some background, a bio, to introduce you to our listeners. So, Doug McDonald is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Montana. Since 2006, his research at the university has been focused on the Native American archaeology of Montana, Wyoming, and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In 2018, the University of Washington Press published his book, Before Yellowstone, Native American Archaeology in the National Park. This book 
provides a wonderful overview of the last 11,000 years of Native American use of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and much of the research in the book was highlighted in a January 2021 cover article in Smithsonian Magazine. McDonald's Yellowstone Archaeological Project has also provided research for the completion of more than 15 graduate student projects, as well as more than 20 published articles and book chapters, including one recently in American Antiquity, which is the major journal of American archaeology. Other published books by McDonald include Montana Before History, um, published in 2012 by Mountain Press, and that is a textbook reference book for all archaeology in Montana. And we are all so grateful <laughs> that Doug yes. sat down to compile all that information yes. in one place. So it's, a, it's an amazing reference guide. It's a wonderful tool for students and anybody interested in sort of having um, access to information about what we know about the archaeology in the state. Um, also, uh, he's published Yellowstone Archaeology and Lithics in the West, um, some of which are um, somewhat more technical um, reports and works um, in in those books. Um, so welcome, Doug, and we're so excited that you're here with us today. So, Doug. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, too. It's my uh, my second podcast. I did one after that Smithsonian article came out. I did one um, in some group in Iowa. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. That's okay. wonderful. Well, it's nice to be doing one in your home state. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It's nice for you guys to do this. I, I looked at your um, your last one with Jack Fisher. That was fun. That yeah. was fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really good interview. Um, and so, Doug, what is the name of that article that was in the Smithsonian? Is it Lost Yellowstone? Is that the name of the article? I think that's what it was called. Yeah. Okay. All right. And it was It was written by Richard Grant, who's a... He writes a lot of articles for the Smithsonian, but he's also a, a novelist. He, he's published a lot of books, especially on um, like the Louisiana, Mississippi region is his target area of interest. But he had read the Before Yellowstone book. And maybe, you know, after it came out, he emailed me and I had no idea who he was and I didn't expect anything of it. And then Yellowstone agreed to the interview and so he came out with a, a photographer, he's, I'm forgetting his name right now, but a photographer from Kalispell who is on call for those sorts of things. And they traveled around in Yellowstone with us for a few days in, in uh, summer two years ago. And it was a lot of fun. Beth Horton, the park archaeologist, was with was with the with us. So it was the four of us just sort of going around to the hot spots of Yellowstone archaeology. So it was a lot of fun. I didn't expect a 27-page cover article, I'll be honest. Yeah. I expected like two pages, maybe. And um, well, Doug, you and this topic are fascinating, then that's what that tells you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so we're excited. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it was great to see other voices in that article, too. Mm -hmm. Shane Doyle, who's a board member of Extreme History Project, and Elaine Hale, who's also a board member of Extreme History Project. So it was fun to see their, them mentioned in the article as well, some quotes from them. Too. So it was just a great article. It was really informative. It was really um, just beautifully done. The photographs are beautiful as well. So I we encourage everyone to go out and read that article. And of course, we'll be posting it on the Dirt on the Past Facebook page to make it easy for you to find. But it's just a great article. And we're going to talk a lot about the things that are in that article as we go forward in this conversation today. But before we dive into that, Doug, we'd like to know what brought you to the field of archaeology and anthropology, and more specifically, Yellowstone National Park archaeology. Yeah, it depends how deep you want to dive into my my interest in archaeology. Came during an, as an undergrad, I was in Mexico. Um, I was originally studying like economic development of uh, Central and South American countries, and got interested in archaeology when I was down there, and then started taking classes back at university, um, and then just switched just switched my major because of some influential faculty at my under undergrad. Um, then I went to Washington State University. Had a lot of great faculty um, spur me along to continue a career in archaeology. And so um, I've done a variety of archaeology. I've probably worked in 10 or 15 states, you know, outside of our region here, but I've worked back east quite a lot and eventually made our, my way back out into Montana and Wyoming, this region, got the job at the University of Montana here in 2000, 
six or seven and um, immediately just started contacting federal agencies to see what kind of support they could use from an academic per, uh, perspective. And just so happens that at the time, Ann Johnson was the park archaeologist and she's an alumna of University of Montana and Elaine Hale, who had uh, close ties to the University of Montana. And I think she got her degree there as well, actually, now that her, she got her master's degree there. And so they were amenable to it. They didn't have much funding for it. And I didn't really care about that. And so we were able to pull together that original field school for the summer, I think 2006 or seven. And there's been no looking back. We've been working there for 15 years and it's wow. been just great for, for my own research, um, for um, our students. Obviously it's been a wonderful opportunity for them to get experience working for the federal government. You know, a lot of our students here at the University of Montana are going to work for the Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, other federal agencies. And so the Park Service work in Yellowstone provides a good opportunity for them to um, get that experience they need to then just step right into work when they get done. Yeah, and what a great opportunity for students to be able to do archaeology in Yellowstone National Park <laughs> and get to really explore some of these questions that they have when they are doing this work. I'd, I've seen so many of your students give papers at the right. Montana Archaeological Society and at the Society for American Archaeology meetings talking about the research they've done with you in Yellowstone National Park. So it's just such a great Great opportunity. Well, it's also a beautiful place yeah. to do archaeology. I would, if I had the choice, I would have been like, this looks like a pretty cushy dig. Even if it's yeah. not cushy, the, the scenery is going to make right. up for whatever. <laughs> I don't think it's always cushy. I've heard some stories. but <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm always like, do you get to live in park service digs or are you just intense? So we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, we, had a rough, we had a really rough year this year because we started kind of maybe a little too early. Oh Because no. I was on sabbatical last year. So as soon as the snow melted, we were like, let's go, you know, and <laughs> we were working on, on the Gardner River, just south of Gardner. And uh, yeah, we had to cancel it a couple of times in April, May for snow. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I know you're at high elevation. When yeah. Mike Neely and I were in, in Judith Gap area, we started very early in May. And we had some days that were so incredibly cold. We we had to come back and let people warm up before we could go out again. I'd, I'd never been that cold on a dig before. So <laughs> so I can only imagine <laughs> what you guys had going on. So let's talk a little bit, though, um, about the background of Yellowstone National Park before we dive into our next question. So the park itself was established by Congress and signed into law by President Grant on March 1st of 1872. And so this year, 2022, marks the 150th anniversary of the park. So it's a, it's a timely topic right now to sort of be revisiting different aspects of the history and, and deeper, deep time history of the park. Yellowstone has the distinction of being the first national park in the U.S. Um, I think it's one that people often, it's high on their list to visit. It's got geysers. It's got wildlife. It's a really large um, space. When we think of Yellowstone, though, I think the American public often does not associate the place with Native peoples. Um, instead, they think more about the wildlife, bison, wolves, and bears, as well as the geothermal features, the geysers, and, and all of that. But your book, this book, Before Yellowstone, really helps people better understand that Yellowstone has always been a place where people lived, not just in the recent past, right around the time of contact, but really as far back as we know we have people in North America, in the interior of the continent. Um, if you talk to anyone who is descendant um, from any of the tribal nations, uh, they can certainly tell you this, and you've backed this up with ethnographic data, as well as extensive archaeological research in the park over this past 10 to 15 years that you've been working on this. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about what your questions might have been. I know you said when you were looking for a project, you were looking to collaborate with some of the land managers, you know, forest service or park managers around there for a project in the region. But when you zeroed in on Yellowstone, did you have a specific idea of what you might want to find or expected to find in the park? 
Um, so tell us a little bit about your thinking as well as then how you designed the archaeological field work that you and your students then actually conducted there. Yeah, so we act as a consultant in a lot of ways for Yellowstone, and, and a lot of the projects are just meeting the needs of Yellowstone, right? So they have funding that they can support for various sorts of projects that we become involved in as, as a sort of a, a low rent <laughs> consultant, if you will, and just saves them a little money down the road by working with us because we have students and I don't charge a lot for my time on the projects. And it's just that most federal agencies don't have a lot of money and Yellowstone certainly is in that boat. So Doug, would this be like that. if they were doing um, repairs to a road or to a building and they had to do anything, they w would be required to have an archaeological consultant in case any remains. So so part of it is you're really acting like a, a CRM agency or so for them as well. Okay. Yeah, so CRM is cultural resource management, as you know, and so that's what we're training our students here to do. And they're going to end up working for places like Yellowstone. And so the projects that we become involved in are cultural resource management based. They're in response to actions by the federal agencies. And so the one major project we've been doing recently was in the Hayden Valley. The, the federal highways has provided funding to Yellowstone to widen that road like they have in other places, like they just finished around Obsidian Cliff. If you've traveled through the park recently, that's a really nice road through there now with nice big shoulders as opposed to some other areas of the park where you're afraid, if, especially if you're in one of those giant RVs, you probably feel like you're going to fall off the cliff, but um, they're widening the road across the park. And so that that's a federal action. They need to do cultural resource management. And so University of Montana steps in and helps out with that. Um, they've used the University of Wyoming in the past. They've also used archaeological consultants in the past as well. So it's not like we're the first people to do archaeology in Yellowstone. Uh, there's been plenty of other archaeologists working in the park since since the 50s, really. So there's a there's sort of a body of data then that you already could could research before you even start um, where you're going to be. But you didn't then design, um, say, like a park wide survey or have a specific research design. You're designing research to to also meet the needs of what the park has to have done. Um, as yeah, the, so a good example is our first project ever in Yellowstone was in the Gardner region, mm -hmm. Gardner, Montana, just at that north entrance. So a lot of people don't realize that north of the north entrance arch, which is so famous from Roosevelt, right, uh, opening up the park there in 1903 or whatever, the, the arch was there. People think, well, that's the border, but actually the park goes for another about 10 or 12 miles north of there. It's called the Boundary Lands, and it is part of Yellowstone. And so there's a, the old train station, Cinnabar, is back in there. It's a his, historic original train station where the Northern Pacific stopped from 1883 to 1903. And so they knew sort of where that was, um, but didn't know exactly where it was. And so when I was talking to Ann Johnson and, and uh, Elaine Hale, they were like, yeah, we could use you. We could come. In. We could have a field school maybe, and you could come in and help us identify where this is and maybe do some excavations there just to make sure we know exactly where Cinnabar is. And so I said, yeah, sure. But I, my real research interest, as you know, is Native American archaeology in the park. And and so they, they said, yeah, well, why don't we just do a big survey of the boundary lands? And so that's the area along the Yellowstone River, north of Gardner, up about maybe 10, 12 miles. And so we surveyed all that. Um, ended up finding some really interesting Native American archaeology along there to meet my research needs. We did find Cinnabar. We excavated the, the foundation of the hotel, for example. Oh, and cool. Part, yeah. part of a blacksmith shop and a latrine and and uh, with some really fun, both historic and Native American archaeology. And so we try to, Yellowstone's been great about working with me and what's going to be of interest to me and in my research, but also facilitating their needs uh, in terms of what they need to do to meet their federal obligations legally. So definitely a win-win, um, and, and for all of us, too, who get yeah. to benefit from the information. Yeah, you know, it's, I'm so glad you found Cinnabar. And, and that's one of those student papers I think I listened to is about that, that hotel foundation um, a few years ago. That was fascinating. So um, 
we want to talk a little bit more about some of the archaeology that you've done. And we're going to um, go way back in time. We're going to go back to the beginning and talk about how long people have lived in Yellowstone. And you mentioned in your book that there's evidence of people living in the area from about 11,000 years ago. So can you tell us a little bit more about this and then also tell us what Yellowstone what we now call Yellowstone National Park would have looked like 11,000 years ago. So 11,000 years ago was the time when we, I think most archaeologists working in like the eighties and nineties thought that was the first people in North and South America was about 11,000 years ago. Since the eighties and nineties, the last 20 years or so, there have been a number of archeological sites found from Chile to Oregon, to Alaska, to Florida, to Texas, showing that people have been in North and South America before 11,000 years ago, probably all the way back to 13 and 14,000 years ago. And now with the white sands footprints, maybe even 20,000 years ago. But in Yellowstone, we're really pretty sure that Native Americans were there not before 11,000 years ago in all likelihood, because it really would not have been a great place to be. <laughs> um, if you can imagine a hundred foot tall glacier above Yellowstone Lake melting 13 or 14,000 years ago. And then if you've ever seen sort of a glacial landscape where glaciers are melting, the downstream is just a mucky mess and, and just not a great place to be a lot of bugs. And so it would have taken a little while for, animals to get up into Yellowstone uh, from places like the Yellowstone River Valley, from the Madison River Valley, from the Snake River Valley, from the Bighorn Basin to the east. Eventually, you know, they worked their way up into the higher elevation Yellowstone Plateau. But, and that looks like it was probably amenable for people around the time Clovis started to really expand across North America. So Clovis is the, what we consider to be one of the original Native American cultures. All the 48 continental United States have evidence of this original Clovis people, and some places have evidence of even earlier, earlier peoples. But in Yellowstone, it looks like Clovis probably was first, and even they weren't there very much. So we, have, we know that they were using obsidian cliff. I know you want to talk about that a little later. We found one or two. Clovis points produced from obsidian, cliff obsidian, so we know they were there to collect it. Um, but other than that, it's just scant. Like, I don't even, mm. I think they got up there, they're like, okay, here's some obsidian, now let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, it really <laughs> probably didn't have a lot of food resources until maybe it looks like after 10,000 years ago. And that's when human use of Yellowstone starts to really pick up. There's a culture called the Cody culture and one of Ann Johnson's famous archeological sites at Yellowstone Lake is called Osprey Beach. That dates to about 9,500 years ago. And once you get into that time period, you find lots of archeological sites in Yellowstone. So it really looks like 11,000 years ago, people, Native Americans find Yellowstone. Then it takes them a little while to realize, okay, there's some food here, we can actually live here. So that was probably after 10,000 years ago. But since that time, Native Americans have lived in Yellowstone and, and used that landscape quite a lot. Yeah, being at such high elevation and having those glaciers melt, I'm sure it takes a while, as you're saying, for just the, the plant life and then the grazers or the animals that are living off it that Native Americans might have been hunting or the plants they would have wanted to gather to just sort of become available. So it's interesting to think about. It seems like, though, almost as soon as it seems likely they were able there's some evidence that people were there, even if populations were really small, um, which is fascinating. Um, I We interviewed um, Matthew Bennett, and I, I know you just mentioned um, the White Sands footprints and um, our interview with him. I, I was just blown away kind of by this idea that footprints could be preserved in these um, lake beds, sort of the edges of them when lakes had retreated. And I think in the book you had talked about lake levels going down in the Yellowstone Lake over time. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the dates are for that. But um, I wanted, you know, to ask you two things sort of about that. First, you know, what is your reaction to the science um, that um, Bennett and others present in that article about the footprints? And and then also, um, when we, we talked with Dr. Bennett, he, he said this was really, um, this has been an area that he's asked to weigh in on 
more and more with his his geological expertise he's developed around it because it's something that's very difficult to find and and archaeologists often have been doing other work and haven't necessarily been focused on trying to find the footprints so could there be footprints on the you know surroundings of these lake beds in, in the Yellowstone area that we might be able to to look at and would we see mammoth prints alongside them yeah, just like yeah. they found in white sand so so weigh in <laughs> on that for us well i can say no to the mammoths they've never found any evidence that mammoths or camels or horses were they were gone mammoth. they were gone in by the time like yeah higher around yellowstone lake especially okay mice and antiquus for sure but okay um, now i think if, if we took our time in excavation and really focused on finding footprints, we probably could find one or two. <laughs> but I can't even imagine how long it would take. We wouldn't be able to get done the projects that Yeltsin wants us to get done. So have I ever excavated through a footprint? I'm almost positive that I probably have. <laughs> I was going to say, it was, yeah. it was mind-boggling to me to try to understand what they were doing and how they talked about how ephemeral they were, too, that you had to really kind of quickly document what you might be seeing and or they might go away so um i can't imagine um but just the idea that there could be yeah. you know maybe someday someone will make M matthew bennett hang out in yellowstone and then we'll see what he can do <laughs> and you know that that idea that um like you were saying doug you know you probably aren't even looking for the footprints because you're do you have other focuses but that made me think well maybe now more archaeologists will look for those footprints while they're doing their other work they'll keep their eyes open for those since they obviously are there so mm, yeah could be, could be. Yeah. yeah the the types of environments where i would look for those would be in areas where we have ash that's been deposited. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in some areas of Montana, you get Mount St. Helens ash. Before that, there's all kinds of other ashes. Mount Mazama about 7,000 years ago exploded. Crater Lake in Oregon is Mount Mazama. There's ash all over the inland Northwest. So like if you have a pristine level of ash that you know was laid down in one day, 6,800 years ago, those are the sort of settings where I, I might take my time and maybe look for things like that. Okay. Right. Yeah. But, you know, I, I haven't encountered that in Yellowstone. We have, we find pockets of ash, but it's, it seems to be coming from underneath. <laughs> it's like roots and vegetation that's oh, been burned sure. because of the okay. hot soil. It's not. You don't we, have a layer. It like erupted a really... so long ago that we don't really find ash deposition. Hmm. with associated with people that would would have been living there so right right okay well good we cleared yeah, that up then yeah, all right yeah, nothing good, to good. see here okay <laughs> <laughs> um so um you know you've talked about the many significant archaeological sites in Yellowstone in this book um i mean i was fascinated just to know about the range of things from from standing wiki ups which are all those um sort of wood and branches and tree poles kind of leaning to to make a, a conical structure um not unlike you imagine the shape of a, a teepee but these wouldn't necessarily have totally had skins around them or or might have had some um all the way to um just isolated stone tools but stone circles um all different kinds of of cairns features that may have been used for different um perhaps fasting beds um things like that, um, evidence for hunting, evidence for tool making. There's just all kinds of evidence of, of camping or activity um, going on in the park. But um, one of the, the most impressive sites I think that so many of us um, who've done archaeology in Montana are familiar with is Obsidian Cliff. And it is one of the few sites that's actually named right when you come in the park. That's pretty obvious, though it, though it's not something you can actually go visit in the sense that you would go walk on to the site or anything, which always bums me out. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you devote a whole chapter uh, to this site in the book. And um, so what Obsidian Cliff is, is a large magma flow that formed around 180,000 years ago 
and the the flow um, spread and turned into this extremely glassy obsidian, um, which is over sort of a three by one mile area, which is just incredible to think about that much obsidian um, covering that much area. And the rapid cooling of that magma that had a lot of silica and it creates a fantastic source of obsidian. So native people, as soon as they knew about it, which sounds like at least as far back as the Clovis era, would periodically come to Obsidian Cliff um, to mine chunks of it. And indeed, some of it has ended up in the Anzic site. And we find Obsidian Cliff, Obsidian um, all over parts of Montana and even as far away as Ohio in um, a Hopewell era mound site, which is remarkable to think about. Um, so tell us a little bit more of what you've learned about the site, your experience there, and just in general, why it's so significant, not only to archaeologists, but just to what we understand about Native people um, in the region and the history of that region. Yeah, so Obsidian Cliff is, is I would say, Yellowstone's most important archaeological site. And I think the Yellowstone Park archaeologists agree with me on that. Um, it's probably Wyoming's most important Native American archaeological site. It, it is a National Historic Landmark. I, uh, sometime in the early 90s, it was established, I think 1992 maybe, as a National Historic Landmark, which means it is a very important place in the history of our country. And um, it's, you know, it's always amazing to me is how quickly Native Americans discovered these places. And so, you know, they're... Montana and Wyoming's original hard rock miners, I say that over and over, <laughs> but they could trace a seam of stone like like modern geologic scientists can and, and, and probably better just by knowing the terrain and uh, stone was so important to their livelihood and, and way of, ways of making a living that finding good quality stone was super important. So from that reason, Obsidian Cliff became important to Native American peoples from all over it doesn't, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, did one tribe control it and then defend it as because it was so important? And and it, we've found no evidence that that obsidian was protected in any way. And that, that may be why it became so widely distributed, because it was just so abundant. And I think in the Yellowstone book, I say something like there's enough obsidian to have filled 300 Super Bowls, you know, like the Rose Bowl of, you know, it's, wow. it just that's crazy huge, to think about a huge amount. <laughs> And I think Native Americans realize that and said, and there's multiple, since it is so big spatially also, there's multiple ways to get access to it. And so mm -hmm. somebody could be on the east side of it, somebody could be on the west side of it, somebody could be up on top of it, and from different tribes even, and you might might not even know, I, I, maybe that's a little far-fetched, but the point is that a lot of Native American tribes used it. And I think the most significant use of it was about two or 3,000 years ago, like you said, we have um, hundreds of pounds. It's not as if it was like one or two little pieces of obsidian at those Ohio mounds. There's 300 pounds of obsidian was found in one of, one of the mounds. And so that has led to speculation as to whether Native Americans from Ohio actually traveled to collect it as an exotic item to put in their burial mounds. So that's what the point of the obsidian was, is that to honor the deceased, they were putting these exotic goods in in the mounds in, in honor of their grandmother or grandfather or or an important person like a, a chief or a or Doug, leader. Was there any evidence that they they were also were they using the obsidian first? Is there evidence of where and use, or or do you think they were more specifically, as you say, you know, gathered primarily just for a mortuary you know item? I would say they probably were using it, especially the debris. Um, but there is evidence that they were making these really beautiful, elaborate obsidian ceremonial knives and blades at the mounds. So if you look at the exterior of the mounds near mm. doors and things, there's there's flint napping debris. So they're going theoretically. If if Ohio Native Americans did walk two thousand miles. And back, I've estimated it would have taken a most of a year, probably leaving in March or April from Ohio, following the Ohio River, you know, following part of the Mississippi. It would have been almost an identical route that Lewis and Clark took mm. in the early 1800s, right? And so 
I get a lot of pushback from Lewis and Clark people and saying, there's no way Native Americans did that. And I was like, well, they had boats. They used exactly yeah, the same so, yeah. boats that, um, you know, we know the Hopewell had boats and they could have easily paddled down most of, most of the way. And uh, at least into Montana. And then, then it's just a matter of, uh, you know, there's dozens of different stone sources that they probably were, collecting from not just obsidian cliff but it looks like obsidian cliff might have been on the western edge now there's another obsidian source called bear gulch which is a little further west in idaho Mm -hmm. it's up on the montana idaho line kind of south of the bitterroot valley um but that was also used and so when they did the sourcing of the hopewell mounds obsidian most of it came back as obsidian cliff but some of it did come back from bear gulch so it Mm -hmm. looks like the Yellowstone ecosystem was as far west as that trading kind of got, but it's not out of the question to think that people would have traveled that far, collected a bunch of obsidian, used dogs as beasts of burden to carry it, as well as as boats to get it back home to just have a big stockpile of it. And, you know, there's pottery motifs and other ceremonial objects in the shape of bighorn sheep horns and things mm, like that. Interesting. So yeah. there's, there's other pieces of evidence that kind of say, well, they, somebody from Ohio saw bighorn sheep. Right. Closest place to see that's the Rocky mountains. So it's not out of the realm of speculation. I, but I do get people pushing back really hard. It's like, hmm. there's no way that's, you know, clearly they got that by trade and, they got 300 pounds by trade. I mean. <laughs> yeah, so, little, yeah, what are they getting in return? You know, um, so <laughs> were there no closer obsidian sources for the Hopewell, do you think? Or was there something special no, about? It's just through the Rocky Mountains there. So you have the obsidian in Yellowstone. There's some in New Mexico, Arizona. But there's no obsidian between the Mississippi and cultures, the Hopewell and cultures and in that region. So, yeah, that would have been the one. So it was a really exotic good, that's for sure. Yeah. So now when yeah. you when you can you talk a little bit, Doug, about how we know it's Yellowstone obsidian and not Bear Gulch obsidian and, and how people so how how obsidian is sourced? Yeah, so all the volcanic flows that produce obsidian have diagnostic chemical characteristics. And by comparing the source material from say obsidian cliff and bear gulch and Other obsidian sources, you can compare it to the artifacts that you find at the archaeological sites. And then you get a really good idea about where Native Americans were traveling, because if I'm working at an archaeological site in Ohio, I can I can say for certain that that piece of obsidian that I find is is all the way from Yellowstone. So then it's figuring out whether they got it by trade or or if, if there was human movement that in that great a distance and Hmm. um, I use it for my own research because I'm really interested in hunter gatherers just as a lifestyle that you know all of our ancestors and some we all have family that were hunter gatherers that's crazy for a lot of people to think about in this modern era but we're all here because of people Mm -hmm. that were successful hunter gatherers right Mm -hmm. we all have great 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 grandmothers and fathers that could make stone tools and leather for clothing and and, and live off the land. And so that's always interested me. And so Yellowstone provides a great laboratory in a sense of, of finding archeological sites of hunter gatherer peoples um, mm-hmm. and tracing the movements of those hunter gatherers is super interesting. And you can do that by the obsidian. So. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating to me that you get pushback from people about the, the transport referring to Lewis and Clark, because so much of what Lewis and Clark could accomplish was because they were asking and following the existing routes of all the native peoples in that area. I mean, they wouldn't have gone all the way out to the Pacific and back without all that. And they were following well-traveled routes. So, so yeah, Yeah. so good for you. Just push back. Yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, we always hear, you know, there's so much evidence that native people traveled extensively throughout the United States. Um, So there's, there's so much travel that was done that I don't think we even do today. And we have cars. (laughs) No, I know when you hear these, you know, these Olivella shells coming all the way yeah. from the Pacific and they're ending up again all the way way in the interior. It's it's just fascinating to think about the movement of peoples and then the movement of objects between people. You yeah, know, and and probably yeah. a lot of that was trade as well. But um, but that's interesting, Doug, to think about it as you know, as specific people coming here to get that um, 
Yeah, and the Hopewell case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah don't, I don't, I, like you said, I, I don't want to underestimate the trade networks because yeah, you know, we know there was a big trade right. network. Right. Right. But it was also there were a lot of economic in, incentives to be, have this stuff. So you, right. it's almost like a capitalist system in which right. you're collecting all these trade goods to trade with other people and. Yeah. Right. If you right. could, if there was a safe route for some Ohio Hopewellian Native Americans to just, you know, you can imagine young, I wouldn't imagine it was older folks like me, maybe wouldn't yeah. have done it, but I, <laughs> I know. I could see it. Well, like 20s, 30s year olds. <laughs> my, right. young, totally. my, son, my son being like, yeah, let's do it. You know? yeah. <laughs> grandpa, grandpa just died. Let's go get some obsidian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would have been a good adventure. And, we do those sorts of things now it's it's certainly i think it's it is like you said well known that that, that people were traveling great distances right yeah right. yeah so i wanted to move on from obsidian cliff and talk a little bit about a short story that you have in the book called raising the teepee a prehistoric narrative and this really stood out to me and in this story you tell um you tell about an extended family and their lives when they were moving from a summer camp to a winter camp and it's based, the story is based around an archaeological site that you and your team excavated in 2008 called the Airport Rings Archaeological Site. And it's a really a um, narrative done in a storytelling way that gives us such a good interpretive overview of what you and your students learned from the site when you were doing the archaeology. And, uh, and Nancy and I have talked to other historians and archaeologists who are starting to use this story form narrative in their work. And and we have talked about on the podcast before how much we love this. And we talked to Kelly Dixon, your colleague Kelly Dixon, about this and how she used it in her book, Boomtown Saloon. So so tell us a little bit about why you decided to to use this in this in your book before Yellowstone and and also do you encourage your students to use this kind of interpretive writing and do you um, do you require them to do that? <laughs> I think you no, should, it, but <laughs> you know it gets a little tricky because you know I'm I'm speaking from the point of view of a observer almost of a Native American family and I'm not Native American so really. I'm looking at it from the point of view of a hunter gatherer almost like um, could be any hunter gatherer throughout the world, in- including my ancestors from Northern England, Scotland or something. That's sort of how I'm envisioning that world is just hunter gatherers. And obviously these are native American people, but hunter gatherer lifestyles are similar throughout the world and that sort of thing. So when I wrote that, I was really looking at it from the perspective of just how would hunter gatherers be, be living and how does our archeology span contribute to that understanding and just excavating the stone circles at that site and, and seeing some of the patterning of the, the way we had a fire pit in the center of the teepee. So usually that's in a circumstance where it's cold. So I envisioned sort of a fall scenario when a winter storm is blowing in off electric peak, you know, in the Gardner area. And, and then the, what we found in inside the structure was that the smoke and the the, not that well, we can't find smoke in archaeology, but we found the ash had collected up against the edge of where the teepee was. So we, we found a real, found the fire pit. And then just to the northeast of that was this big concentration of ash. So you're imagining a scenario where the door was left open or something like that. And so I imagine a scenario where you have this family living in a teepee and this young guy has to go to the bathroom. So he gets up in the middle of the night, goes out, takes goes to the bathroom and then comes back and forgets to close the door. And, you know, that was sort of the scenario that I was envisioning for this story. And it is a story. It's just completely made up, but, you know, but not completely, you know, based on some facts about there was definitely the prevailing wind is from the Southwest in that area. And so you can imagine a wind blowing into the teepee and everybody getting really irritated at that person that went to the bathroom. <laughs> we told you to go before yeah. you went to bed, turn yeah. the light off, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it is a way just to make it more human, I guess yeah. is another way of looking at it. It's, you know, I, these are people living their lives, their daily lives. And we're just like you and me. So mm-hmm. that's sort of the way I envision that. I, I had thought about writing um, the whole book from that perspective, but got mm-hmm. a little pushback um, just because I'm not Native American. And I think there, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be pretending to be. 
And so that little short story was a l- brought a little room to do that without stepping on anybody's toes. <laughs> So way to breathe life really into the information, the archaeological information, which I think it is very helpful for people. I also think just this book in general, you wrote it for um, a wonderfully general audience. And so I think it takes all of the information about the park, the history of the park, the archaeology of the park, and puts it in a narrative form with lots of wonderful visuals that's really fun for people and accessible. And I, I just don't think there has been another book like that out there. And I, I was thinking if I was going to teach um, Anthropology 101 again for our archaeology section, this would be a wonderful book for people because there's so many ways to talk about methodology in there as well as then within the framework of understanding the park, which is something they all know about, but as you point out, don't necessarily know about the history of the people that live there. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to take a quick station break, Doug, before we go on to our next question. You are listening to The Dirt on the Past with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We're speaking today with author and archaeologist Doug McDonald about his book, Before Yellowstone, Native American Archaeology in the Park. Did you have another question, Crystal, that you want to sneak in there before I... Well, I did. I just wanted to follow up a little bit about the storytelling because I just yes, think it's go, so go. important. Yeah. <laughs> I know you do. Go. Yeah. You, you just knew you could sense it. I could, sense, could sense it. it. Yep. As we sat here next to each other. <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to say how, you know, as you're sitting doing archaeology in one location, you guys are probably at this location for at least a week or two or three or six. And you probably, we as humans, just naturally start thinking about the stories of the people who lived in those places that you were excavating. You know, who held this rock last? Who left that door open? You know, that, those sorts of things. And I think that um, as I've sat many summers on archaeological sites, you just naturally start telling these stories to yourself in your head and start telling your, these stories to each other, those people who are excavating. So I love that you put that story in and and um, and that it really brought those people to life, as you said, Nancy. So I just I guess I just wanted to say that. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you liked it. You know, um, yeah. I think that was one of the pieces of the book that Richard Grant also liked. That he's the guy that wrote the Smithsonian article, and I've had a couple of people comment who are writers about that, and so you should write a book from that perspective. And you know, maybe when I I'm old and retired, that's what I'll do. <laughs> that's that well, would we be look, amazing. We look forward to that. Don't get too old. Well, yeah. Meg Conkey, when we we did interviewed her on her podcast, isn't she the one that talked about some archaeological fiction that she actually yeah. assigns in some of her classes? And I think we really underestimate the power of um, what archaeology can do to kind of inform these narratives, so they're actually grounded in what we know, but really then bring to life an understanding of these this deep past. So it's been exciting to hear more archaeologists yeah. think about that and talk about that, because I, I think we do the science very well, but then often the science doesn't get out anywhere interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, that's why both the Montana Before History book and the Before Yellowstone, they're written sort of for classes that I teach here at the University of Montana, but they're, you know, just written for a, somebody that doesn't know anything about Right. Those topics, but but even more so, the Before Yellowstone book was written for just the fact that, you know, the park and I, park archaeologists Beth and Tom and Tobin Roop and I had talked about, you know, if I'm going to write this book, we want a tourist just to be able to pick it up and be yep, able to read it. Exactly. And maybe yeah. Come away from it as as um, wow, Native Americans lived here, <laughs> didn't know that. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. So. Yeah, and to really then kind of put themselves in that place, because I think it is yeah. fascinating to think about what it would be like to be a hunter-gatherer, especially in that landscape. Yeah. Um, and so so the park itself uh, has a very complicated history. So um, as, you're, as you say in the book, when in 1872 – the 2.2 million acres were signed into law to become America's first official national park because you you kind of had Yosemite being a state park sort of in California. Before that, that's the only one that sort of potentially existed before. But at that time, you still had indigenous people 
you know, living along the lake shores of Yellowstone Lake, um, camping along the Madison and Yellowstone rivers. You mentioned, you know, when Lewis and Clark came through, um, John Coulter, who was one of the members of that expedition, decided to to stay out west when they went back. And he talks about encountering people when he goes into Yellowstone Park and, and tells the stories of geysers and things like that. And Osborne Russell, you mentioned, too, in 1834. So there's there's all these eyewitness accounts historically by even Euro-Americans that there were Native Americans in the park, aside from the archaeology. Um, so we know these people were really pushed out pushed onto reservations, but yet the wider American public was really made to believe that there were no Native people living in the park. Um, One uh, reason they were given was that Native Americans were afraid of the geysers, um, this water shooting out of the ground. And um, (laughs) we know that this is not true and that this is pure nonsense, but this, this myth persists. It does. Um, You you still hear people talking about today because it just gets passed down. Um, but we know through archaeological research that indigenous people frequented the park's thermal features. They went for spiritual, medicinal, and subsistence reasons, and you have evidence, archaeological evidence, of Native people being in those areas where the thermal features are. So we know that there wasn't this um, fear that kept them from the whole region, and in fact, they were taking advantage of some of those properties. So once your Americans arrived in the in the area, um, and Native people were pushed out. This narrative of the park as preserving wilderness really began, and I think even grew o- over time. Especially once you started to get park staff in there, um, and and really creating it as a destination, and it was declared the primary goal of the park. Um, so bringing it present, which is what you've done with this book, is that noting today that there's so little interpretation in the park concerning Native people and their presence. Um, instead, the focus is on this this idea of wilderness, the natural beauty of the park, um, the, the wild, amazing, majestic animals that are in the park. Um, and and really not much about the cultural resources, and I don't even I don't even like really using that term cultural resources. Mm-hmm. It's this this ancestral homeland that yeah. was used by by more than twenty six tribes. You mention in the book um, have have um, claims and histories related to this area. Um, So more recently, the park has tried to rectify this inaccurate history. And in the early 2000s, they funded um, an important ethnographic study of Native Americans. And the result of that uh, was in 2004, Restoring a Presence, which is a book by Peter Nabokov and Larry Lowendorf. So I just wanted you to comment on that and and your thoughts on how the park could continue to do work to add people back into the interpretation of the park landscape. Yeah, you know, I I think maybe just first to comment on the idea that Yellowstone's a wilderness, right? So when we think of the term wilderness, we think of a place where nobody's lived and that's unlivable by humans. So if people went in there, they'd be like, wow, we just, you know, it's a wilderness. There's no reason to be here. And so it's sort of it, when we call Yellowstone a wilderness, I mean, when we call some places, you know, like the Beartooth Wilderness or some of the wildernesses around Bozeman or Missoula, where we all live, it's <clears throat> somewhat of an ethnocentric concept because it certainly is implying that based on the definition in the dictionary that people never lived there and they couldn't live there. And so I guess I want to say that with a caveat because Native Americans have lived here in Montana, Wyoming, in this region for thousands of years. And so when we're calling something a wilderness, is it really a wilderness? And so when we think about Yellowstone as a pristine landscape, and it's such, so beautiful, you know, I, every time I go back there to do more field work, I, I love it. And I'm certainly one of those people that likes to see the geysers and I, I go look for the wolves and all that stuff too. But, you know, I, I just don't want to forget the idea that is it really that pristine because the major predator that lived there for 11,000 years isn't there. Right. And so that's kind of a hard concept for wildlife biologists to wrap their head around. And it's almost impossible for them to take into consideration, right. It's just not, we're not going to reintroduce hunter gatherers to the landscape. Oh, shoot. Really? Darn it. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I know. Could you imagine though, the impacts though that hunter gatherers would have? I mean, that's fascinating to think about. Mm -hmm. 
So it is something. So it's not pristine, really. You right. know, it's it's not the same way that it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, with that said, it's technically probably not a wilderness. And uh, and I'd say the the best evidence for that is was this past summer. I took a group of students up into the Gallatin Range, and and we were way up on the Skyrim Trail. I don't know if you guys have ever. Uh, hiked that trail. It's just one of the higher elevation ones in Yellowstone. And there were archaeological sites everywhere. I'm just, oh, and bet. it's just yeah. like, you know, it's, you know, the, one of the best stories about that was those early mountaineers down in the Tetons that went just through the first mountain climbers ever to reach the summits <laughs> of these big mountains. And they get up there and there's forts, you know, they're clearly these days, I think I would probably say they were, they were probably looking at fasting beds, right? Yeah. Um, you know, up on these mountain peaks that we know, Shoshone, Crow, other Native American tribes used for spiritual purposes, and they would go to high elevations for white bark pine harvests and all kinds of different reasons. And so it's just crazy to, you know, to think about that and to think that uh, almost every place I've ever looked at, no matter what the elevation or whether it was near a hot spring or a, the peak of a, a big mountain, like Electric Peak, there's just archaeology everywhere. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do. I do think that the park should do a better job of that, and I know they're they've been trying to do that. And I know the park cultural resource archaeology staff is really pushing really hard for that, and and that was one of the reasons they wanted the book published, right? I wouldn't have been out allowed to publish that book, probably at least maybe not in the same way uh, without the without Yellowstone looking at it and saying, yeah, this is kind of this looks great, and, and at least doing a a look through and to make sure it wasn't um, painting a picture that they didn't approve of, I guess, but they loved it. They, they really did. They encouraged me to do it um, and really saw it as a way to, you know, acknowledge the presence and the history of native Americans in the park. With that said, I think they are developing a new display at that museum at fishing bridge. Uh, There have been displays at the mammoth hot springs um, visitor center. Uh, There's, some displays there at the Gardner Heritage Research Center occasionally. Um, There's, you know, signage throughout the park about Native American places like Nez Perce Crossing and those sorts of things. But, you know, I I think it would be nice to have, you know, my ideal would be an interpretive trail up to the top of Obsidian Cliff, you know. And I get a lot of pushback from that too. It's like, you want somebody to go, aren't they going to steal Obsidian? And I was like, well, they built interpretive trails over hot springs that are deadly, you know, and and I think they can probably do one that would be safe and would prevent collecting by people of the obsidian. Right. Right. You know, at least to show people the big pits. So native Americans weren't just sort of casually collecting obsidian from obsidian cliff. They were digging, digging giant pits. They were mining mining for it. And so that's visible on the surface and, there's a couple spots where that could be done without too much trouble. And um, that would be just, remarkable to see. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. to see a person. Yeah, yeah just something it's, like that. Well, it would and create a- such a huge impact, I think, understanding when we talk about people coming to these resources over literally 10, 11,000 years. You know, yeah. what does that look like? That would be fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's other places it could be done, maybe where it's not such a big obsidian source you know i just i think the park just really is reluctant to do something like that because they're afraid of um tourists going in there and just taking obsidian willy-nilly and i i totally understand that but it seems like we maybe could do it in a creative way that would prevent it but yeah with that said there's some smaller obsidian sources too that actually aren't too far from already existing trails Mm -hmm. and maybe those would be better places to do it and so there's there are no native american interpretive trails in the park you know, those would be good places to start. There's all, there's the Nez Perce trip through Yellowstone in 1877. And I think mostly what people think of when they think of Native Americans in Yellowstone probably is that Nez Perce 1877 movement through the park, trying to reach Sitting Bull in Saskatchewan. But, um, you know, so when that could be another place, group, you know, there are, si- there are signs for that, but, you know, maybe highlight those a little more and um, you know, the tricky part is balancing it with with the archaeological site protection. And I think that is is really difficult for the federal archaeologists and that work in those places to ba- make that balance. So I think they're trying hard. And I think, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll get some more of that. Mm-hmm. 
I, I just was thinking, because we, we talked to Scott Carpenter about his work at Yosemite and how um, a portion of that park is now under the control of tribes, you know, who had literally been eradicated, you know, violently um, as they were creating that park there um, originally. And now the, the idea is to, it's still part of the park, it's protected, but what happens there and what could be built there is is really something that the tribes are doing. And it just seems that instead of maybe um, bringing people directly to sites that might be under threat, there are other ways to create that sense of presence. And I know that Shane Doyle has talked about, you know, areas where maybe you have all the different tribes have teepees raised that have their own cultural symbols on it for their tribal symbols on it. And so that there's a place where people can really imagine and see the presence, even if it's not at all an archaeological site. We know people were there. So it seems like there's lots of ways that, you know, don't get me wrong, I would pay money to go to see Obsidian Cliff, but I <laughs> I think um yeah. I think there's lots of ways other than just signage, you know, that we we could make it more clear to people and and engage their imagination like you do with that story so that they understand what it would have been like to live there, you know, and not no longer think of it as just a wilderness area and and understand the deep roots the tribes have, you know, to that landscape. Yeah, and bring and bring the the tribal nations, um, the twenty six tribal nations that call that place home, bring them back in and and hopefully there's some movement in this hundred and fiftieth anniversary of Yellowstone National Park to do that, to start to um and I know there is collaboration between the national park and these twenty six nations, but it would be wonderful to see them in the park and see them represented in the park in some way. And um, along that vein, you know, there's when you were writing your book, I think you even got a little bit of pushback on representing people um, on the cover. Because I remember when you did a presentation, Doug, for the Extreme History Project lecture series when the book came out in 2018. You talked about how your publisher, how you had this beautiful illustration to put on the cover of people. It was an illustration of people. Right, by Eric Carlson. <laughs> by Eric Carlson, who yeah, yeah. yeah. has amazing illustrations yeah. throughout this book. And um, and they said they said no. And now on the cover is a is a picture of a, um, a pool with bison um, tracks going through it. So just tell us a little bit about that interaction. <laughs> that was a that was a really tough negotiation. And I, I kind of learned my lesson because the original the first book I wrote was Montana Before History, which is a terrible title. But I was it was my first book, and I didn't even at that time, think about the implications that, oh, if you say it's Montana before history, that means that there was no history. <laughs> right, right. There was no Montana. No history. <laughs> no history. So I didn't even think about it at the time. I was like, yeah, sure. You want to publish my book? Let's do it. Yeah. And they had a couple other titles that were led. They had like California before history. And oh, okay. gonna, um, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a series. Yeah. So I was like, okay, whatever. So when this book was being published before Yellowstone, I really wanted that illustration of the first Native American people to see Old Faithful erupt, you know, imagining this Clovis original Native American group family walking into that valley along the Firehole River and just seeing it explode. Mm. That's the illustration. I think it's it's maybe in the first, maybe page 20 or something now. It's in the book. But yeah. That was originally made for the cover. And when I showed it to the publisher, they said, that's not a cover. Oh. And I was just like, okay, I guess I don't know anything. Oh That's, my gosh. You know, um, which I don't know anything about book marketing. And so they were looking at it from this, what's going to catch the reader's eye perspective. And so they chose that bright orange bison footprints at, I think it's, it's probably at um, a grand prismatic or something like that, where there's yeah. like nice orange, orangey water. But in hindsight, I also regret that because it totally removes the people from yeah. the, which the whole point of the book was to put people in Yellowstone and here the cover of this book doesn't have people. In it, it doesn't communicate what yeah. the book is about yeah. at all. It makes no. it, it makes it look like, yeah, it was just animals. It was just wilderness again, yeah. which is what yeah. <laughs> when you're trying it's just to the whole point of your book. Say, the, no. Yeah. 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 Oh, that, that's yeah, gotta I, be. I was, 
when I talked, when I was talking, I was like, have you read this book? And, and they're just like, yeah, we're not going to use that illustration as the cover. Oh, Which one yeah. of these do you like? They actually thought that the, there's a picture of a fasting bed on one of the tops of the mountains. Yeah. They'd like that for the cover. Yeah. But then I talked to some tribal oh, Native American yeah. um, individuals and they're like, well, we don't know if that's still being used. It could touch on some sensitive religious spiritual things. Probably not, but you never know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah. I said, even though that would be cool, it's, we can't use that for the cover. Mm-hmm. And so then they, they got this professional photographer. Couldn't picture. they have just like photoshopped in a projectile point or something there <laughs> next to one of the footprints? Like just something, you know? It's like, come on. There's no cultural artifacts at all. Nothing. Oh, God. I know. And, That's a great illustration. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, it's, it's on, on page, page 47. Yeah. It's and it's fantastic. If it's the one, if I open to the right one, but yeah, it's on page 47. It's just beautiful. And, and it, and it just would capture the book perfectly. So I always imagine this is the cover when yeah. I look at your book. <laughs> Maybe if they do a reprint someday, that'll be. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Then you have to be strong, Doug, and say, no, we can, we have to change the cover. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's I a mystery heard, book publishing. I've heard they're going to do a reprint, but if it does, I really would like them to change that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think they probably are getting close to selling out, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if they wanted to do it. But the University of Washington Press doesn't have huge budgets, so they might just let it go out of print. Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, Darn. maybe another press would pick it up. I don't yeah. know how that works. Yeah. But anyway, so that's well, that's exciting. But I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that interaction. It seems yeah. seems silly you don't get to have the final say on your own book. But. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm always amazed at that. <laughs> so, um, Doug, there's so much more we could ask and discuss with you. You've done um, so much archaeology. Uh, not only in Yellowstone, but around, but we've run out of time here today. And um, so we just want to remind our listeners that Before Yellowstone is a fascinating and beautiful book. It has a lot of full color photographs of landscapes, artifacts, the archaeology sort of in action. Um, and, a, and some great illustrations that yeah. could have been cover art. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a really um, easy read, f- but filled with the facts that have come out from 10 to 15 years of archaeological research. And it really puts people back onto the landscape um, where they had been all this time. Um, so we're, we're just excited to get more word of of your book out for people who are interested in Yellowstone and for people who are interested in in archaeology in the region. Yeah, and then also the that article by the Smithsonian, mm. uh, Lost Yellowstone. If you um, Google that, you should find it right away. That's a great article to read. That's very accessible and very interesting as well. So thank you so much, Doug, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Doug. And thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your podcast feed each week. And if you can, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about The The Dirt dirt on the the past. Past. A big thank you to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin. Thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music and John Chadwell for help getting the podcast out in the world. 